So what I will do is to first write you down an action principle from, so to connect to things you maybe know a little bit more and then quickly to go to quantum theory, discuss what uh, basically Silva has done but now for this other theory and um, derive the, I mean, all kinds of properties you will see later. Good, so let's start. So this was one, so now let's go to two. Um, good, so Westomino Witten models are basically theories where you have fields which map into a Lie group. So, um, so just to fix some conventions, I will also consider the theory for now at least only on the Riemann sphere S2. Everything I do is Euclidean. So I can use complex analysis as Sylvain did. And then as I said, uh, I need, will need some Lie group. So I have some Lie group, um, which I will always denote by G. If you don't like Lie groups or you don't want to be very abstract, you can just think of this as being SU2, which is good enough for most of the lectures. And yeah, for technical reasons, I will also assume this to be complex and simple for most, uh, compact and simple for most of the time. So just think in terms of SU2. Good. And then I've also an associated the algebra, which I will denote by funny G, which is the Lie algebra. And on this Lie algebra, I have some inner product. Sorry if this is boring, but we'll get interesting in a second. So I can take an inner product by just taking the trace of two elements. And here I'm just thinking in terms of matrices. So I think, okay, so SE2 is a two by two matrix. These are also two by two matrices and I just take traces like that. I will have some, so any Lie algebra element X, I can write in terms of some generators, X, A, T, A, and the sum over all my A's. So for SE2 it's three plus and minus. And I normalize my trace such that this is a half delta AB. Or I think of this being some fundamental representation of my Lie algebra. Good, so now it's getting more interesting. So as I said, uh, my west simulator model should take fields from my Riemann sphere, where my theory is defined, to my target space, which is this Lie group G. So it consists of all fields which map from S2 into G. Good, so I promise this will be classical to start with. So I want to write down some action. Okay, I call this action as naught. And there's some normalization factor, which I call one over four lambda squared. Then I integrate over my two sphere. And now I write down some kind of kinetic term. Good, so that's why I need my trace. And the sort of canonical kinetic term you can write down is this one. So you take, uh, you have your two derivatives because it's a bosonic theory, and um, to make something nice, you take derivatives of g and also put g to the minus ones there. So if you know a little bit of ge uh, differential geometry, you might recognize that there's a one form appearing. You can also write this term thing in terms of a one form, which is just g mu d mu g dx mu. And this one form is the pullback of the maurer cartan form which lives on G. So if you don't know this, it doesn't matter. That is our kinetic term. So my remark is only that this G to, G to minus one DG actually lives in the Lie algebra. And that's why I use this trace. So I have two elements of the Lie algebra and I trace them. So I have my favorite quadratic kinetic term. Good, so this action has a nice symmetry which is given by mapping our group element, which I emphasize here depends on z and z bar. So this is, these are my two coordinates on the complex plane. 
and I map it to another G, G, uh, G and here, okay, there are many Gs in this equation. So I multiply from the left with some constant group element and from the right with some other constant group element. So these are real constants, they don't depend on Z or Z bar. And that is a symmetry of the action. Because if you plug it in, every G to minus one and G will kill the G left and the G right, basically. And then you use the cyclicity of the trace, so also the rightmost and the leftmost of those group elements cancel. Good. So we have this nice G cross G symmetry. And classically, this theory is conformally invariant. So let's start to move towards CFT, because basically I didn't put any uh, dimensional full constant into the action. So classically, it's conformally invariant. But if you compute the beta function, as you do in quantum field theory, compute the beta function, you will see that actually it's not renormal, it's, uh, the coupling constant is, acquires an anomalous dimension. So it's not a CFT at the quantum level. That's why this action will not be our final action for the Westermann Witten model. There will be an additional term. But let's go on and compute the equations of motion. So to do this, we do our favorite recipe and vary our action with respect to a small perturbation. So we have this. And let's wiggle around a little bit so it's quadratic, so there will be twice the same term. And I won't pre present all the details. You can find them in the lecture notes. If you conveniently rewrite this, so there's a two because of this quadratic term, and then you have to vary this g to minus one into the dg. You put it back together. What you get is this g to minus one d mu g, like this. Then you integrate by parts. So these are just the usual steps you do to derive the equations of motion. g to minus one dg. So this is my variation of my group element. And here I get d mu g to minus one d mu g. But I guess I have a minus sign from the integration by parts. Okay, so since this dg is arbitrary, I see that my integrand already has to vanish, and this means that this quantity here has to vanish. So the equations of motions are simply d mu g to the minus one d mu g is zero. Good, and you see that this takes the form of a current conservation. So I can just declare this to be a current, and then it's just d mu j mu is equal to zero. So let's give this name actually. So my current is j mu like that, and it's conserved. And I told you before there's a symmetry. So you might expect that this is actually the current of one of the symmetry, and that turns out to be true. This is the current for the right multiplication symmetry. And there's similarly a current for the left multiplication symmetry, which simply takes the form uh, the other way around. So d mu g to minus one, like this. Good, and maybe I should give another name, but we won't use it anymore, so it doesn't matter. And uh, the conservation of this is equivalent to conservation of this, as you can check. Okay, so let me mention one further thing. Let me write down the conservation of the current in terms of complex coordinates. So uh, I have the z bar component of my current and my z component. And here, okay, let me simply write d and d bar of jz zero. Okay, I just wrote the same equation. I just wrote this conservation equation in complex coordinates. And I lowered the indice index. So if I write g upper upper z, it's g lower z bar. Okay. Good. And um, now, even though Sylvain didn't mention this too much. Um, let me compare this with the situation for the energy momentum tensor. Just to recall, so he introduced the energy momentum tensor, he just called T. And generally you know from GR or something that the energy momentum tensor actually is T mu nu, has two components. So you might ask what, are, what was the T he actually introduced? And it turns out that the energy momentum tensor for a CFT is traceless, so actually the Tz 
which in complex coordinates means that tzz bar is zero. And then there, and it's also symmetric, so there are only two independent entries, which are tzz and tz bar z bar. And so in general, I would write like this. And similarly for the other components. So if this and this. So this would be my conservation. And for CFTs, these terms are absent because of this. And this tells me that my TZZ is actually holomorphic. My TZ bar Z bar is actually anti-holomorphic. So I want to mirror this, per, this thing here with my current. So I would like to hope that one of the components of the currents actually just vanish identically. If that's true, then the other component will be holomorphic or anti-holomorphic, depending on which I choose to vanish. OK, but uh, that's a nice wish, but it's not true. OK, so this is what I want, but it's not true. And this is related to the fact that this is actually not a CFT at the quantum level. Good. Yeah, there's an argument in the lecture note why it's actually not true. Could hope that it's true. But, um, good. So that was this principal carry model. So now I will modify the actions. Are there, are there any questions to this? Yes. Yes, I could. Uh, I didn't say you what is the energy momentum tensor in this particular model, and I don't want to. But uh, in principle, I could obtain it, for example, by coupling this theory to a metric and varying the action with respect to this metric. But this is entirely general. This is for any 2D CFT. Uh, the, the energy momentum tensor is traceless. Good. Um, so let's go to this 2.2. So as promised, I will add an extra term to this. And let me just write down the extra term, which is slightly confusing. Uh, so I call it gamma. Or, yeah, this is a gamma and which is minus i over 12 pi, some normalization constant. And then here I have actually a three-dimensional integral over a ball. I will explain you in a second what it means. Epsilon alpha beta gamma times trace of g2 minus 1 d alpha g, g2 minus 1 d beta g, g2 minus 1 d gamma g. Okay. And again, if you like ge differential geometry, you can also write this as an integral over the ball in terms of a form. And the form is just g2 minus 1 dg, which, if you like, g2 minus 1 dg, which g2 minus 1 dg. So that's just an alternative way of writing it. So why is there suddenly a three-dimensional integral coming up? Um, so this ball is to be understood as extending the Riemann sphere into its interior. So I take the Riemann sphere, and I just put an interior in it, which will be a three-dimensional ball. And these Gs now I just extend as fields over this three-dimensional ball. OK, something I can do. Of course, nobody told me at this point that this is a well-defined thing, because I just put artificially another dimension to my theory. OK, so, but let's worry about this later. And so my final action will be the original action, and then I add another coupling constant and the new part of the action. And let's compute again the equations of motion and see what happens. And you will see that this is actually a well-defined thing to write down. So let's take the variation of this thing, and for the moment I take the differential form language because it's slightly more convenient. I have some prefactors um, like this. I'm not entirely, don't get me on the factors. Um, they might be not entirely right, I hope. But, um, good. So here I have three times the same thing, so I will get a factor of three. So actually, I think there's a factor of three wrong here, but I will check later. Um, so I vary the same thing. Like this. So I get three times the same term, so I only put the first one. 
And then I can, again, conveniently repack this. And there's some prefactor. And uh, the th thing is that I can write this as a total derivative, as a total d. g to minus 1 dg, g to minus 1 dg, which g to minus 1 dg. Many g's around. So this step, you can check that if you take d of this, you get this again. So you see that I get an integral of an exact form, or if you want, total derivative. And by Stokes' theorem, this just collapses to an integral over the boundary of that space. So what happens is that this is the same thing as the same integral over S2 of trace g to minus 1 dg, g to minus 1 dg. And I'm missing another g to minus 1 dg. Good. And then again, you can integrate by parts and compute the equations for motion. But you see that the actual variation of the action only depends on the, of the value of the sphere, of the field on the boundary of the space. So it doesn't actually matter what, con what analytic continuation I take of this g. And I get some new term of the equations of motion that I can again determine the whole equations of motion. Good. And let me also mention that there is still this g cross g symmetry. So this new term didn't spoil my g cross g symmetry because I can still multiply from the left and right this g, and again, everything will cancel out. By this g cross g symmetry, I mean this g left, g right thing there. Um, good. So now, let me give a sneaky preview of the quantum theory, what will happen. Because, so we said in the classical th theory, everything is fine. I can compute my equations of motion. However, if I want to compute something in the quantum theory, I do some kind of path integral over all my possible g's. And then I take e to minus s. So since I'm a Euclidean signature, there's no i there. And this depends on g. So, but there's a potential danger here because we, th we showed that if I slightly vary my, my action, this doesn't depend on the continuation. But it could, what is still, I mean, what we didn't show is that the, this lambda is actually completely independent of what g I choose, what extension of my g I choose. So in this exponential, it can happen that this s is actually multi-valued. So it can be multi-valued because I can still choose different g's. It doesn't depend if I slightly wiggle around my g, but you can take different topolog topologically different extensions of the same g. So let me explain this in more detail. And then you see that the action actually depends on what extension I take. Good. So why is that? Because, uh, first of all, why can I at all take this extension? I can take this extension basically because my fields, they map me from S2 into G. But there's a mathematical thing which is called homotopy groups, um, which exactly measure whether such maps are topologically trivial or not. So if you don't know this, it's not too bad. Um, then just believe me that the following is true. You can show that for any simple compact Lie group, this pi 2, which is the second homotopy group, of the Lie group is one, which means that any G, which is such a map, can be continuously deformed to be the identity map, or to be a map which mapped, maps just to one point, the constant map, I should say. So the constant map can obviously be extended into the interior of S2. So there's no, and hence also any other map, because any other map is deformation uh, equivalent to this map. But so this tells you that I can write this down at all, but it still doesn't tell you whether it's unique. And then the, indeed, let's assume you have two different extensions. Let's call them G and G tilde. So these are two different extensions. And they map now from the ball. So two unions of the ball. So this one takes this ball. So this is a disjoint union. And this maps you from the other ball into G. But we also know that on the boundary of the two balls, they are the same map. So 
It will get less mathematical in a second again. Um, so on the boundary, I can identify these spaces because they're the same map. So, but now if I take the two balls and identify them on their boundary, this is just the same space topologically as the three sphere. So if I two, get two different extensions, they will differ by some map which goes from the three sphere into G. And now we need the third homotopy group. And the third homotopy group of simple regroups, compact regroups is always the integers. So this tells you that there is an integer in which tells you, which parameterizes you how non-unique is your extension of your map G. Good, and then you can do a little computation which tells you, which is in the notes, that if you take this, um, this gamma and compute it for two such different extensions, then what you will get out is two pi i times an integer where this integer is pre precisely this integer, which tells you how, non -u how topologically different your ex extensions were. Okay, so if you didn't follow this, it doesn't really matter. The, the point is that S of G is not unique, but it's only unique because this gamma of G I couldn't uniquely define. I can only define up to two pi i times an integer. So I can only define this up to 2 pi i and k. Okay, n is an integer. k is my coupling constant. And now I want to put this into the exponential. So there's potential danger, because if it's not unique, then I cannot put it into the, the, the exponential. But since this is an exponential, I can still put it there if it's unique up to 2 pi i times an integer because if I add something 2 pi i times an integer in the exponential, it doesn't matter. So this tells me that the quantum theory can only be well defined if k is also an integer. Yes? Um, yes, yes, but this is, yes. Maybe you can do something like this, but this would mean that you sum over different, I mean, you put additional information, so you, you need this additional dimension really to get, I mean, it's not entirely two-dimensional in the theory, but maybe you can do something like this. Um, good, so this is a very important conclusion, and we will see it later again, how it comes about algebraically. So this was the topological argument. Good. So finally, let's look again at the equations of motion of the theory. So now I have those two terms, so I should add them up and get my equations of motion. And I write them in complex coordinates. So I have something like this. Lambda squared k over 4 pi d bar g to minus 1 dg is 0. Okay, so the original term was the one we had. Without this, I multiplied through with lambda squared. But so this one term is the one we had previously, which comes from this principal current model. And now I add this other term, which almost looks the same in the equations of motion. There's just a sign difference here. And now remember maybe my wish. My wish was that one of the components of the currents just vanishes identically. This would tell you that the other component is holomorphic. And that's great, because we can actually do this. We have two parameters here, lambda squared and k, and we just choose lambda squared such that one of the terms vanish. So um, I just choose lambda squared to be uh, 4 pi over k. Okay, this also tells you that k is not only an integer, it's a positive integer. Because lambda squared should be positive, otherwise the action will be negative. 
Good, so I fixed this lambda squared, so the only left parameter now is this k, which is called the level of the theory. And this achieves now that we have some holomorphic quantities, which is something we like very much in 2D CFTs. So now this thing is anti-holomorphic, and similarly this thing the other way around, so which would be dg, g2 minus 1 is holomorphic. Good. And I can give them pretty names. So I call now the current J, I call minus, should be the holomorphic thing. There's just a normalization constant there. And the current J bar is the anti-holomorphic one, uh, which is this one. And there's also a nice normalization constant, which is plus K, but it doesn't really matter. Good. So we have those two conserved currents, and one is holomorphic, the other is anti-holomorphic. Okay, that's the important thing you should get out of it. And you might suspect there's actually an enhanced symmetry here, because now you have holomorphic, anti-holomorphic quantities, and this is related to the fact that this G cross G symmetry we had before is now extended to a local, or semi-local, whatever you like, um, symmetry. So where the left multiplication G can actually depend on Z holomorphically, and the right multiplication G I had up there, still here, the G R can depend on Z R, uh, on Z bar. So this is now a local theory, local symmetry. Good. Are there any questions to this part? Maybe, uh, yes. So uh, you, uh, I guess maybe you can see. Um, this is all classical, this derivation of the currents, but you sort of hinted that this is the right thing to get the quantum. Yes. Can you give some insight on why that's the reason? Good. Uh, the reason is basically, I will also tell you, oh, maybe I should re uh, repeat. So the question is why I did classical things and I, I told you already this will be the correct thing to do also quantum mechanically and I used it in a path integral. So the reason is because things are now holomorphic and anti-holomorphic, they're protected under renormalization. Is if you're familiar with 4D n equal to 2, it's like, um, it's like so holomorphicity pre, um, basically protects operators in the quantum theory. Because the only way you can destroy holomorphicity perturbatively is to introduce some branch cuts and so on. So that's the basic reason. Sorry, yes. 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 Good. But, but to conclude that they're holomorphic, you first need to know that it's traceless. So also the tracelessness would get spoiled in the quantum theory. Yes. Yes. Uh, it does not rely on some assumption, no. And also P1, pi 1 of a group can only be non-zero if the group is non-simple. So for any simply group, pi 1 and pi 2 are zero. Yes. So if you choose non-simply connected group, it's not modified, but the only way you can make at least semi-simple, I mean semi-simple already tells you it's non is simply connected, but then you can put some U1 factors. That's basically all you can do. Otherwise, it's, if you do something like reductive or solvable groups, then it becomes crazy. I don't want to consider these. Okay. Ah, that's what you mean. Yes. Um, that indeed modifies things. So if, for instance, if you consider SO3 in terms of S, instead of SU2, then uh, there is some issue. It's not related to this. Uh, this um, so this extension still works always. The problem is that this integer, or it's not a problem, but this integer n you get is actually always an even integer. Sorry, a half integer. It's the other way around, half integer. So k has to be an even integer. So yeah, this modifies indeed. Thanks for the remark.
Good. So let's do quantum. So the first part is uh, to basically find out what is the analog of the Verasoro algebra. Of course, the theory will turn out to be conformal, so there will be Verasoro algebra later on. But first, there's the more basic question, what should actually be the commutation relations of the modes of the currents instead of jumping directly to the modes of the energy momentum tails? Good. And in principle, how you could do this, you have your classical action. You can compute Poisson brackets, so you know the canonical commutation relations. You can impose that those still hold quantum mechanically, convince yourself that there is no possible renormalization, and postulate some commutation relations. So this is something you can do. It's not the route I want to take. Uh, the route I want to take is to constrain what is actually the possible OPEs you can get. So again, OPEs are equivalent to uh, commutation relations of the modes. That's something Silva briefly told you about, because he had the Verasoro algebra, and he could translate into, in terms of an OPE of two energy momentum tensors. So I want to basically figure out what are the OPEs of my currents. And I, I uh, focus on my left moving currents, meaning the holomorphic ones. So I will also have always a right moving copy, which is J bar and Z bar here. But let's just focus on one of them. So what should be this analog? Just like pre briefly recall, I want the analog of this. So here, here this equation. So, and what should be the analog of J's? So what is the operator product expansion? Good, so I, I will write like this. This means up to regular terms. So I, I can write O1 here if you want. Good, so let's do some dimensional analysis. What were the currents? So this current is g to minus one, or it's the other way around. It's uh, dg g to minus one. That was this current with a constant. So what's the classical dimension of this? Just the length dimension. The length dimension is one, because there's one derivative here. So I have one, or oh, minus one, maybe. Yeah. Um, but I will call it one. This is, will turn out to have conformal dimension one. So I have one derivative here. So this in total has dimension two. So anything I write on the right-hand side should have the same dimension. So let's just write something general. So I will sum over the singularities, which are here, one, two, and four. So there's just some set, which will appear like this, okay? And whatever appears here is some new field, and this new field should have dimension. So the dimension of this field, xp is two minus p, just by dimensional analysis. So here's two, this has minus p, so to make this work, I should choose two minus p. Good, so now I give you some input. You didn't hear till now, but maybe uh, you know that in a CFT, in a unitary CFT, the CFT will turn out to be unitary, you don't have so many low dimension operators. So in particular, if you make this P larger and larger and larger, you will have more poles, more poles, you will have negative dimension operator. So if negative dimension operator, the only way is so they will turn out to be non-unitary. So if you want something unitary, you shouldn't allow for negative dimension operators. So the lowest dimension, so the, low, the lowest energy of any unitary CFT is the vacuum, which has dimension zero. So this means that P bigger than two is not allowed. So again, everything I see, say here can also be derived from the the Poisson brackets, but I just want to show you that this very general conclusion I make here. So this is not allowed. So let's look at the two allowed ones. So I have p equal to two and p equal to one. These are my only possible poles if I make this assumption of unitarity. And the regular things I don't care about. Good, p equal to two, I need something which has weight zero. 
dimension zero. And the only thing I just told you of dimension zero in a unitary CFT is the vacuum. And the corresponding field via the operator field correspondence Silvan has introduced is the identity field. Okay, so the only thing I can write down here is a propor something proportional to the identity. So here I have identity. And at p equal to one, of x1 of w, plus dimension one. Okay, but we already saw a bunch of dimension one operators. These were the j's themselves. J's themselves had dimension one and they were holomorphic. So you conclude that everything which can appear here are the j's themselves. If there were other dimension one operators, these would be other conserved currents. So you would have more symmetry, but we didn't put in more symmetry. So that's all there can be. So just by this naive counting, you see that the only possible OPE you can get is, okay, you have some constants which can depend on A and B. And then you have the identity. I won't write identity, it's just one. Second order pole. And then you can have some constants I conveniently call like this. Um, and a first order pole. So this has to be a combination, again, of the old fields. So I will have some constants, call F, A, B, C. Good. So this is my OP. And let's put some more constraints on these constants. So we, should, we want some more things. So what do we want? Sylvain so told you that this should be the same thing as G, B, J, A, Z, because the OP is something which is supposed to hold inside of correlation functions. So you can expand it the other way around. And for instance, for the second order pole, you immediately see that this kappa AB should be symmetric. It's the same as kappa BA. Similarly, you see that the F is anti-symmetric in the first two indices because the Z minus W is sine. Sorry about that. Okay, so these are the two conditions you get there. And then you have a third condition or next, another condition, if you put a third current here, you can either do the OP first in the first two currents, and then do the OP of the resulting thing with the third current, or you can do it the other way around. So that's associativity of the OP. And that gives you further conditions, which go all of, which are of the form F, A, B, D. So there are three others where you cyclically permute the three, three indices. And you get also a Jacobi type identity. A, B, D, B, C, E, uh, that's a D. Okay, and then you have two other terms which are cyclically permuted in the three indices and zero. Okay, so these are the constraints you get, you can check. So, but all this is telling you is that the Fs are actually structure constants of a D algebra because structure constants should precisely satisfy that they're anti-symmetric in the first two indices and that they satisfy the Jacobi identity. Okay, yes? You mean how did those go? Okay, so, uh, so they're just more of these, but they're, they're, they're of the same type. Okay, let me try to get the indices right. So I should, um, there's kappa B, B D, F, C, A, D, so I just cyclically permuted the three, three indices A, B, C. And there's a third one where I again permute. So there's three identities of that type. Let me write also the last one, which is kappa A, D, F, B, C, D. Okay, makes sense. So this is the dot, dot, dot here. <laughs> Uh, yes, thanks, thanks. Yes, uh, was this a confusion? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Good. Okay, um, so this tells you that, as I said, F, A, B, C are structure constants. of some Lie algebra. And what should be the Lie algebra? It should be our symmetry Lie algebra. So this is of our Lie algebra funny G, which was the Lie algebra of our Lie group G with which we started. Okay, I, I agree there was a break here. I 
thematic break, but you can check that this is really the structure you get from up, uh, from the action up there. Okay, so I'm almost done, so let me just write final conclusion here. Good, and uh, here this tells you, this line tells you that the kappa AB is an invariant form on the Lie algebra. So the only invariant form you can write on a simple Lie algebra is actually this, or oh, it's proportional to this. Okay, this is the only invariant form you can write. And this I normalized in the very beginning, if you recall, to be proportional to delta AB. So I just chose my generator such that this is delta AB. And this tells you that kappa AB is just a multiple of delta AB. And this multiple I will call suggestively K. So let me again write the OP in its final form of two currents like this. Get K delta AB, Z minus W squared, plus I F A B C, J C W, Z minus W. Okay, where well, these are the structure constants of our original Lie algebra G. And here I put this constant K. So you see, you get one free constant in the whole construction. And this free constant, if you actually do the calculation, turns out to be the same K we put into the action. So this is the same K. So that's important. Okay, so small K. Anyway, um, yes? Of course. And like second, this. there is some normalization there of the current with the K in front. So there, yes. the idea is that you fix that normalization to get the correct FABC. Exactly. It fixes you. Exactly. So maybe yes. So maybe I tell this again. So. Um, so of course you could say, okay, let's just rescale my currents by whatever you want to change this constant to be whatever you want. But that's not possible because my normalization of the current is already fixed by assuming that there's just FABC here, not two FABC or something like this. Okay, I want here um, a constant one which fixes the normalization of my current. And then this K is uniquely fixed. <coughs> Unless maybe let me also make the remark if this was an abelian Lie algebra, meaning that all commutators are trivial, so all structure constants are trivial. So then there's no way of normalizing the j's in the way I did, and the scale becomes meaningless. And that's just the algebra of free bosons. You maybe know from string theory or so. So if this term is absent, then the k becomes meaningless. And in a free boson, you have never heard of any level of any k. That's why it's just meaningless in this case. You can set it to whatever you want. Okay, and also let me mention, there was also a right-moving copy of this, so I can also put bars everywhere here. And uh, so I just have two copies of the same algebra. One with bar, one without bar. I had the left and the right-moving count. Okay, are there any final questions? Yes? So you said that you cannot have any other dimension one of the Yes. Yes. Well, okay, so, so if you have another holomorphic quantity of dimension one, so then I have uh, some holomorphic current quantity. So the question was why I cannot have any more dimension one holomorphic operators? Because let's just call it, I don't know, X of Z. So that's of dimension one and holomorphic. So since it's holomorphic, I can write it like this. So this is zero. So I can just make stupidly a current where I call this the first component z bar call x and the second component, sorry, this should be z bar downstairs. The second component I call zero. So I have a conserved current. So that means there should be an additional symmetry in the theory, but there is none. So that's why. Yes? Yeah, uh, but but you know, that, yes. Uh, okay, then, then let's, okay. Uh, people are smart and then they know more. But also, again, you can make the explicit computation and just com compute Poisson brackets, canonically quantize, blah, 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 and you will find the same result. So that's my way out. If there are no further questions, let's thank Lawrence and Gianna.